No, it's a pleasure. I guess. <laughs> Yes. Now listen, oh, there is a federal pen located close to there, with it? No. No. You know, it's a good time. You can tell us which food is just come on. That's just, that is the truth. <laughs> the checkered path of the attorney. That would be a long story. And I have to tell you my real name. Okay, I mean, it says that. Uh, it's in here and whatnot. I know what those peaks look like if you're looking up towards Plain and Stone. Tell uh, me. It, it did not come a second it. time either. It won't. Okay. Uh, I mean, I, I just downloaded it a second time. All right. So then we're just going to be looking at you. Okay. I can't switch to your. Uh, you can put anything you want up there on okay. your presentation, but the camera, like going out in the world, isn't going to be able to see the slides. We need to get this back. Hey. Yay. All right. And um, let me get my presentation. That's good. Are you patent man? I am. Not the patent man. No, no, I'm patent man. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. I was thinking, what, like Spider Man, Superman? Patent man. Mm hmm. There you go. Excellent. <laughs> no, I, don't, I don't shoot webs or fly, but hey, when it comes to patent stuff. Well, are you a patent troll? What is a patent troll? Oh, patent troll. Patent troll. we got to know what patent troll is. Our Belgian. That's for I topic. know people can throw that around like a. I don't know if everybody fully knows what I mean, it's an uh, interesting topic. It really is. PBS has done some specials on, on patent trolling. Come on, what's been happening in patent law? Yeah. Let's see. Well, um, we are good, I guess. Um, hey, there's my Twitter account. Yeah. Um, I guess that we can go. Um, I've got the presentations I can turn to. With we have certain questions. Um, Okay. For whatever. Do you want to do, you want to push a button or do you want to do introduction? Push a button. All right. I just think I pushed the right button. All right. Yeah, last time we didn't get in. I mean, I don't know. When I, when I wasn't here, it didn't work. I, I don't know. That's good. Yeah. So. All right. So, so that one's already broadcasting back there. Just hit start recording and then go and we'll move that one over there. Okay, so start recording, start recording first. first. Yeah. Like, can I do that now? Uh, yeah, you can do that. It doesn't matter. You don't have a slide. I've got you in the frame. Okay. You can sit right here for one. I put his hand back here. The small at the back. <laughs> Hello, welcome to the EOK Podcast. Today we are talking to Mr. Robbie Robinson, our latest sponsor. Yay! <laughs> Robinson Intellectual Property Law online at robinsonitlaw.com. Correct? That's correct. Correct. All right. Check that out for any of your intellectual property needs. You need trademarks, patents, copyrights, and anything else that Robbie talks about today. Go over there to his website and find out more about it. I also want to thank our wonderful sponsors, Pershing Yokelin Associates, for providing the space that we're in. They're great people. You need to check them out if you need any accounting support. Or just general business consulting. They're really smart people over here at PYAPC.com. And Neighborhood Nerds online at Schnerd.com, providing residential and small business technical support for a small monthly fee. Online at Schnerd.com, or you can call them at 865 622 2422. And just ask them any kind of question that you want about technology. 
and fairmechanics.com is another great sponsor that we have. Fair Mechanics allows you to post your repair needs for your vehicle, maintenance, repair, and the local area mechanics will bid on those jobs and try to win your business over. And it's a great little application. I use it all the time. And it's wonderful because you just set it and forget it. Kind of like that. What was that thing where you used to set it and forget it with the chicken or the roast or whatever? It was a little poster. Yes, the rotisserie. Maybe we could talk about that. Uh, we could do that. That, 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 that was probably it sounds like it's before my time. <laughs> <laughs> but today, what we're working on is Mr. Robbie Robinson is going to be talking to all of us about intellectual property of all kinds, uh, changes in the law, um, questions you may have. He'll fill those questions for us. Um, because it is a, uh, it's something that you think about whenever you're getting ready to meet with someone. You're like, how do I protect my idea? You know, you're wanting to talk to potential partners, potential investors, maybe a potential exit where you're going to sell your product, or you're just wanting to go out and make it. And you want to make sure you're not like infringing on someone else's rights that are already making something like that. Um, just great stuff. So I'm going to let Robbie get rolling. I'm going to move back around there behind the camera. Thanks a lot, Robbie, for being here. We'll get rolling. Okay. Well, good morning. Uh, glad to be here. It's a pleasure to be here and help out. And what I've found in the past is that whenever I uh, do these types of things, I bring like a PowerPoint, whether we're covering like uh, copyright, trademark, patent law, whatever, and I maybe get a third of the way through it. Um, so I think what may be more helpful is for people who are watching this uh, live on, on the Ustream or what, whatever else, and for people here to, uh, I guess, ask questions and so that way we can get right to the point of, of what uh, the audience is interested in when it comes to intellectual property. Uh, and I will go ahead and just lay out, I think most of, most of you know, but it, when we say intellectual property, we're talking about patents, trademarks, copyrights, and trade secrets. Those are the traditional uh, four pillars of intellectual property law, but that's not all, but those are kind of the four uh, key categories. And so uh, with that uh, very brief uh, summary, I guess what we can do is uh, open the floor to uh, areas of interest or questions or whatever else about what you'd like to uh, discuss today. And by the way, uh, don't give me you know specific examples with regard to specific uh, entities or, or per people. I can't, you know, I'm not going to give legal advice over the over the, uh, <laughs> the interweb. You get in trouble for that? Well, I see, you know, I get paid. Bad yeah, it's, it's just not a good idea. So, so um, but we can talk about hypothetical examples and we can talk about uh, IP and what it is and what it's not. So, all right. Okay. Yep, go ahead, Mr. Richard. Well, I'll ask you a point in turn question. I'm publishing a little pen, a little book. And it's supposed to be, you know, the best one in the world. I explain a lot of things about rooftop garden and the subject matter. So I'm just taking pictures of some of those things and put them in the book. Am I violating? Okay, the, the question was, uh, a gentleman is putting together uh, a pamphlet on rooftop gardening, and he's t he has taken, you've taken some photographs of some different, uh, I guess, plants and, and things in the garden. Yeah, and construction. For, for examples, and, and as far as the pamphlet goes, have you, uh, the, the text, have, did you write the text for the pamphlet? Yeah. Okay, and so you've written the text for it. Um, what? Uh, who else was involved in preparing the pamphlet? Two or three other co-workers. Okay, two or three other co-workers. Are they? Is this under a, for a company or is it for? No, just for us. We are selling them. Okay, and this is—is is this for real or is this like? A, it's for real. It's right here. Okay. It's hypothetical. Okay, it's, it's a for real <laughs> hypothetical. <laughs> Um, well, I mean, one thing I would want to know um, is who contributed to, to the work, who put it together, who helped with the expression. everything except some friends and that's it. Well, um, 
in a situation where you have something that has photographs in it, uh, you have text in it, uh, you have the arrangement of photographs and text in it, those are all ways that uh, someone is expressing information. It's not the information itself, it's the expression of that information. And um, a lot of folks don't know this, but it's when, when a picture uh, is taken, it's not the it's not the picture, the person in the picture, it's not their rights in the uh, the photograph. It's actually the photographer who, who took the picture. Now there are different laws that cover uh, privacy and the right to use someone's name and likeness, but with regard to copyright, the person who took the photograph is actually the owner of the uh, the copyright in that photograph generally, um, and that there's a few exceptions to that. The, one of the biggest exceptions is if that uh, photographer is the employee of a company, in which case the company actually owns um, the rights and the copyright in the photograph. So uh, that's one thing to keep in mind. The same thing is true with text. When you're writing text, um, that text, when you're expressing something, uh, is is copyrighted. And assuming you didn't take it from somebody else, which means it's original, and and it's it's not just some basic little you know few words, but it's but there is some expression to it when you're expressing information. Um, then as soon as you put that text down in a tangible, what's called a tangible medium of expression, and that's taken from the statute, um, then you you as the author uh, own the copyright in that text. And so. There's a lot of things to consider uh, when you're dealing with something like a pamphlet or whatever. And then you've got what's the source of the pamphlet, and that that could be that could include a trademark, you know, something that's that's in it. And we can talk about that in a little bit. But I don't know if that fully answers the the quasi hypothetical uh, example given, but uh, right. yeah. yeah. So. <clears throat> I have a question. Um, we have lots of members that talk about licensing their technology to someone else. <clears throat> so they, they have a great idea, they're wanting to develop that idea, but they don't actually want to go through the process of manufacturing, producing, and doing that piece. They want to meet with some corporation that is already kind of in that business sector, already has the sales and marketing power, and license their product to them to sell. Um, what, what, what do you need to look at when you're going towards one of those relationships? I mean, do, do they ever work out one? You know, like, can you really make money doing that? Or does the large corporation just say, uh, it's cheaper for us just to run over you and steal it? Or how, well, what should you do to prepare for those kinds of meetings? That's, that's a good question. And I don't know, can the microphone pick you up? From yes. This? Okay, good. This one up here picks up everywhere. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. um, but picks you up the best. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Um, <laughs> well, the first thing is, is to put yourself in the shoes of the potential uh, licensee, the, the, the company that would receive this license. And if I were the licensee, I would ask you, okay, what is it that you own that you want to license to my company? And if you don't know the answer to that, then that's problem number one. Okay. Um, that's the first question, and if if uh, and that's where you know talking to somebody like myself or another IP attorney and saying you know what do I have here is 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 what I have protectable and if so, what steps do I need to take to protect it? Should I protect it with uh, you know patent protection? Should I look at it from a trademark law perspective? Should I look at it from a copyright law perspective? What's my you know what do I have? What's my best shot? Um, and then, how should I approach this company uh, to, to, to offer a license to them? So that's the first question: is what do you have? And if you don't know what you have, you need to, to ask some ask somebody to find out what you have. Um, and then after that, assuming there is something that's, that that can be licensed, um, there may be timing issues as to when you should approach uh, a company. To license it. So, so, for example, let's say that you have something that's patentable, and you come to me, and, you, and, and we we see that yeah, this is patentable, and uh, we, we we either do a search or don't do a search, but we file a patent application. Um, at that point, you don't really have to worry about someone going and 
beating you to the patent office and filing because you've already filed. As far as you know, you're the first one. Um, but what you, you should be concerned about to a certain degree is whether this company will just um, take it and, and maybe sell it until you get an issue patent or in before your uh, your application publishes because during that, that window of time, which can be a year and a half, two years sometimes, there's really nothing, there's really no recourse. And so if what you've got is something that someone can make really fast and sell like hotcakes really fast, you might not want to bring it to their attention until after your application is published and or after you have an issue patent. And, and there are different situ it's all fact, there's a lot of fact sensitive things to go into to these types of decisions and um, the, the short of it is, is go get some help to find out what you got and what you need to do. And, and it really depends on the situation. So, I don't know what, what keeps them from just <clears throat> infringing anyway? Like that, you, you have a patent. You're a startup. I mean, you're you're getting you're barely getting by just to get your documentation together and your product out there, your prototypes built. And they do a billion dollar a year themselves. And they look at it and go, well, I mean, he could never defend it. Um, let's just go ahead and build it anyway. Right. That's that's a good question. Being uh, a big company knows that patent litigation is expensive, and if you're a startup company, and you don't have a real uh, deep pocket or a budget for that. Even though you have a patent, the question is, are you going to be able to enforce that patent? Because there are no patent police to do it for you. You have to go get an attorney and, and initiate litigation and, and, and deal with it with the federal courts. Um, and there's different options. There's some, depending on the situation, if it's a clear and cut case of infringement, some firms will take uh, patent infringement cases on what's called a contingency fee basis, where if if you win, the, the firm gets a certain percentage of what's recovered. Um, and that is, for something like patent litigation, usually that's going to have to be a firm that has a lot of, uh, um, I guess, room to do that, probably a, a much bigger firm. And, 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 it's usually going to happen only if they're very, very convinced that it's a it's a slam dunk type of situation. If your situation is not as clear cut, it's 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 more likely that you're not going to be able to rely on a contingency fee uh, situation. You're going to either have to go uh, file suit or and just you know bite the bullet and see how long you can do it. Or maybe try to work out a, a license, in which case maybe that company takes advantage of, of, of your circumstances. Uh, that's that's just the way it, it is in some situations. So. Okay. Yeah. But sometimes you might go get a private backer who, who really supports you and sees that there is something going on, and they've got deeper pockets, and they want to maybe invest in your company. And say, look, these guys, this big company's clearly infringing what we've got a patent on. We believe we can win this, and and you can. Hey, that's it's just the market, you know. Go get a private investor, see if they'll support it. So. Any other questions? Today, with day, it's not day. It has been for a long time. Recently, an insurance company came out with one of their campaigns being about Hump Day. It's caught on, people are using it all over the place. And I sent you a message that a friend sent me with a list of phrases that are supposedly copyrighted. Um, can you explain, and she sent it to me because she was afraid that I might write something I'm not allowed to write. People have been saying, guess what day it is for years. But now that it's come out in a campaign, if she would be the one that would be concerned that I wouldn't be able to write, guess what day it is anymore. Can you explain what you can and cannot? Yeah, I think that that is getting the wires of trademark law and copyright law kind of twisted a little bit. Um, and, well, a camel just walked in the ring. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> uh, I, I think that. Will that get us pulled off of the air, you saying that? <laughs> it really doesn't hurt, yeah. 
Well, the yeah, frame. Right, right. You know, that phrase where that's really not a phrase like that is not protectable under copyright law. It is something you could use and assert is a trademark. Some, and, and so, like right, right. And so, if there, but, but see, it like Wendy's is using that with regard to uh, fast food services and goods associated with that. So, um, you know, if you're, I don't know, a, a ship building company, you know, and you use something similar to that, then is there really going to be a, a problem with them using this, a similar phrase, the same phrase? Uh, Probably not, but there's there, there's an exception as there is to most everything we do. One exception is, for example, if the mark is famous, and if the mark is famous, it really doesn't matter what what business or what area of business a company's in. Like for example, Coca-Cola is a good example. Um, Coca-Cola is a very famous mark, and so if if you wanted to open a company and start making Coca-Cola um, hand tools. You know, like uh, hammers and screwdrivers, um, you're probably not going to be successful uh, for long before you get a, a cease and desist letter. You might say, "Well, I don't make soft drinks. I don't bottle things." That's true, but Coca-Cola is so famous that you know it, it permeates beyond just what they do. You know, so um, what about like just do it? You know, we hear just do it, and you think Nike. Right, yeah, just do it is, is a Nike thing. I, I'm, I haven't studied up on you know what rights they have in that phrase. I'm, I'm pretty sure they they would have a registration with that. Um, then Amazon busted everybody about one click years ago. Well, I remember yeah. that them saying, yeah. "No, we own one click." Well, the one click thing with Amazon was actually in a patent application. They actually had a have a patent. I don't, I don't know if it's expired yet on the process. Of of that, so that actually gets into patent law. So there's there's a lot of confusion, I think, out in, in the public as far as how something's protected, whether it's under patent law, whether it's under trademark law, whether it's under copyright law. So depending on what animal you're dealing with, really determines what rights you have. And so if you're just using a phrase just descriptively to write something, and it perfectly fits in context with what you're writing, then there's really nothing wrong with that. There should not be. And there might be some extreme exceptions to that. Um, like if you were writing a video about a different company that was using something and using another company's tag on in what you were writing. Exactly, and that and that happens. And I've I've been in, in in disputes where that's happened, where someone uses another company's tagline or their trademark, and they put it on their website in in text as if it's just part of their descriptive text. Many many times for, for to help their search engine optimization to redirect their competitors' potential clients or customers to them. So that is an, an example of an exception to that. But that. Um, it, there's exceptions to everything, it seems like, in, in this stuff. But um, I don't know if that fully answered your question about what you can, can do, but when it comes to short phrases like that, if you're using them just to, to describe, if you're just using them in a descriptive way just to communicate information, um, generally speaking, that, that should be fine, unless you're dealing with some exception like the one that I just mentioned. The copyright in those situations is really in the um, the expression of the concept, not the concept itself. Um, but you know, have a camel comes in the room. That's a concept, and it has a hump. But the, the way you express it, and the way you put it on video, the way it's expressed, and so that's protected. Video itself and, and the script and your copyright law. It gets confusing pretty quick. So. I know, like we have <coughs> pieces of material that are uh, trademarked and copyrighted, right? Copy protected, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you how would you actually say copyright protected? Yeah, you can say copyright. Yeah, you can use that as a verb. Yeah. Can you? Yeah, copyright is both. Okay. okay. It's, it's a verb and a noun. Trademark is not a trade. You know, trademark or something. I mean, some people maybe it is in some dictionaries. I don't know. But like, uh, like we have a character. 
that we have a trademark for. Put people up, schnerd.com on that next app. Pull up this. Are, uh, are we allowed to do that? Oh, you yeah, sure is my brain. Let's see. Just do another tab. Schnerd. Schnerd.com. Neighborhood. 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 Urban Dictionary. An EOK okay sponsor. It's a female. You know, and by the way, this is this is kind of, I'm going to stop and have, we're going to have a quick commercial break here. If, if you do need have some IT needs, you can call Neighborhood Nerds, and, and, and Leo said that. One thing I, I think would be funny is if you called them and said you need you have some emotional needs and see what those guys do. <laughs> Let me know about that. We can fix it. Okay. Um, all right, so here's Neighborhood Nerds. I mean, because that's what we're all about is happiness. You know, we're all about making you happy, reducing your stress, and you know the technology is just like something we kind of iron out. To technology your meets your emotional needs. That's so, right. Uh, uh, so Gizmo there is a character that we created that's our persona that talks to everybody. He says howdy neighbor a lot, but we have a lot of things where he says good day mate too. You know, oh, he's, he's from Australia, so he ought to be able to say good day mate. But we had to define him, I think, in our trademark, and you can correct me, but didn't we have to say things about what industry he's for? Like, if this is IT, um, fixing computer, you know, like it, it was all of these things we had to define as categories. Right. And yeah. I was wondering why we have to do that. Why can't you just say, that's my work of art, I trademarked it so I can use it and nobody can make something that looks like it? Right. Um, that that's dealing with the trademark aspect of, of this character, and we we do also have the, the copyright in the character registered, and that that is just there is no categories. It's just the expression of this character is protected uh, the way he's expressed in in the drawing, uh, and that's registered. Now, from a trademark perspective, you have to choose between up uh, you know 45 or more classes, and um, and those are international classes, so, so that there's some continuity between uh, trademark uh, protection here, and if you wanted to, if you also have protection in other countries, um, as far as what class your, your goods or services fall in. And um, there's different reasons for them doing that. It's one way for them to make money, uh, because every class that you select or elect, you have to pay an additional government fee for. Um, but for, for your situation, I think we had to elect a, a couple of three different classes because you wanted to cover some different aspects of, of IT, and, and some of those fell under different classes. Because yeah, we were doing like training classes, and I think that was something. In fact, else. we could pull that up right now on, on the uh, United States Patent and Trademark Office website. Excellent. And we and I had another up. question about that because you contacted us multiple times about. Gizmo and neighborhood nerds and paramechanics saying, hey, this just happened. You need to be aware of it. What do you want to do? Do you just sit around and like monitor that? Or <laughs> no, I don't contact? I don't sit around. I usually am sleeping on the floor. <laughs> yeah, um, because I was just surprised, like, wow, how did Robbie know this? <laughs> yeah, no, we 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 have we're in communication with the, the patent and trademark office, and since we're, like if I was the attorney of record, when anything happens, they send me uh, an email and tell me this has just happened. And we we put it in our docketing system, and we know how many uh, months or however you have before you have to respond or do whatever you need to do. Um, so that's how we, we keep up with that. I was just very impressed because I thought he just sat, you know, with yeah, a buzzer or something like on the side. Like, <laughs> I saw something. Like Googling all day. <laughs> so one of these is just for the phrase neighborhood nerds. Well, that's that's the stylized version there. So let's look at this. We've got uh, two classes. We have international class, you can see here, 37. And we have international class 41. Both of those are classes that include services, not goods. And so in class 37, we have installation and repair of computers and computer hardware networks, installation and repair of consumer electronics products for use in home theater and audio systems, namely televisions, blah, blah, blah. So what we try to do is we try to cover everything that, that you or that the company offers as far as repair for. Uh, we want to keep it as, as simple as we can because the simpler often is, is the broader 
but but they're going to require us to be specific enough to really come down to what, what is it that you're offering. And um, I mean, the main thing is we don't want some other shop opening called Neighborhood Nerds that's right. confused with us. That people think, oh, well, I'm going to the Neighborhood Nerds that have Gizmo and they take care of me. You know, and I can have a glass of wine while I'm waiting for my computer to get fixed. And you get there, and it's like some guy out of his garage. And it's, you know, it's yeah. Not there. Yeah. Yeah, that, and that's and that's what this offers. And so if, if that did happen, you have actually um, you basically would have two federal registrations to assert against uh, that person. And you also have, if they used your character, you would have a copyright registration. So you'd have two counts of, of trademark infringement, one count of copyright infringement. You'd have um, unfair competition under the Lanham Act. And so you'd have all these claims against somebody that were. Um, they would probably stop real quick if they had any sense, or if they went to a lawyer that, that gave them a clear vision of what's to come. <laughs> so, uh, but that's yeah, that excellent. Yeah, yeah, that's perfect. Um, I, had, I did have another question. Like, so how important is it to use your word mark as it is? It's like if you're, you know, you don't want to distort it. You don't want to. What about changing colors or all right. well, structure? Like you pull it apart and use it differently. That that's you're not using it the right way, right? Well, in this case, you want to use it just like this for this registration. But the okay. good thing is, is and this was done purposely. You know, there's color is not claimed as a feature of the mark, and that's that's on purpose because we're not trying to say it's it could be any color. It could be different color. But what we're claiming is just this, this particular stylization and this particular stylization and um, for the top word and the bottom word and the way that they're oriented with respect to one another. A very, very, you know, a slight variation is, is not going to be a big deal, but you can't like flip them or move them around. That's going to be a different. Um, now, the good thing about it is, is we've got this protected, but also we, we file an application to register neighborhood nerves in standard character format, which means it doesn't matter whether it's stylized or not. It doesn't matter if it's on top. Or, you know, it's, it doesn't matter if it's in a logo or not. So this is a much broader registration, which covers any format whatsoever. The other covers the specific format that you use the most. Mm -hmm. So it's like you're protected at multiple levels here. So. Then on Gizmo, Whenever we change Gizmo, because we have a we have Gizmo like we see in there on the website, but we also have Gizmo in a doctor's, you know, scrubs and everything with a stethoscope around his neck, and we have him as a construction worker with a hat and a clipboard. Mm -hmm. We've got him as a, an auto mechanic. I mean, like all kinds of uses of Gizmo where we're targeting those markets. Is is that all protected? Because I mean, he looks the same other than he's in different outfits or different poses doing things. Yeah, you, yeah, there's a character. The party of the nerd or That's right. <laughs> um, he, he is. Uh, now, and, and I have to tell you, because Lisa, love her. You know, but we're, we're in a meeting one day. <laughs> but, and she, but, and she, she said, I just think it's so cool that you dress, you know, so nerdy to be like neighborhood nerds. Like this one, I was like, but I. I'm not trying to. It's not bad. It's just not <laughs> That's that's something you need to call neighborhood nerds about and get some emotional. <laughs> <laughs> but the the question, yes, what what those would be would I would in my opinion I think it would be a like a, a derivative work of the original character uh, copyright because when when that first drawing was made they developed the character in the way this character looks. It is a two dimensional drawing, so you're you're not looking at it as a sculpture of three dimensions. But you can tell what the character looks like, and so when you, when you see that same character, uh, particularly with the same um, color color scheme and that sort of thing, a different outfit, it's it's arguably a derivative work, um, and it's it's also separately copy copyrightable, but it's a derivative work of the original. So. Kind of like Hello Kitty. No. Yeah. Cool. Because I put Hello Kitty in different outfits. Hello Kitty. Mm -hmm. Oh, we did have this. We had uh, we had Gizmo um, for the UT football games. We were building a, uh, a beanbag toss 
So he's on the side of his trailer with his bike, his pool, and it's a graphic representation of him, and he's in a football game. And he's holding his hands like this, like he's receiving a pass. There's a hole in the plastic. And for five bucks, you get three throws to win a prize with the uh, beanbags at the football games. Because there's lots of drunk people, you know, they'll pay money to, they pay money to throw beanbags at them. Well, I would say they've been driven to drinking over the past few years. <laughs> but we put him, the first drawing of him was in a UT, Peyton Manning, helmet, everything, uniform. And someone said, dude, uh, UT won't be happy about that. <laughs> Yeah, I probably don't need to comment on that, too. Uh, <laughs> next! Well... We didn't do it. Oh, we didn't do it. Okay. No, no. Okay. Someone yeah. stopped us. Uh, uh, I don't think we should do that. Went through with it. There's a lot of uh, movement right now in the law when it comes to um, name, likeness, and, and you mentioned Peyton Manning, but um, the name and likeness of collegiate players and the NCAA's rights to that whether they have rights to that as a recent case on that. And that is in flux right now. And then that's a lot and a lot of money is involved. We're talking about these different games that identify players by their number and their names and their jerseys. Um, the, one of the issues is does does the college um, the student who's who's a football player, student athlete does, does he have rights in his own uh, name and likeness, even if that is, is his number with that school's uniform? And, uh, it's an interesting concept about who owns what and who should be paid for. So. But we decided to change it and we put like one of the old timey leather helmets on him instead, you know, and uh, his jersey and stuff are more of the logo colors. So, so we thought, well, that looks cool, looks cool, you know, and, we, and you can't see that it's 16. It's kind of like front of a little bit, so right. kind yeah, of you know. <laughs> I mean, you know <laughs> yeah, the number is. It's, there are other players that have the number sixteen. <laughs> it's a number. Hey, man, he's not. It's not a platinum, so I mean, it's not like that's his likeness. Um, he's kind of a he's, yeah, he's pretty awesome. He's, he's, awesome. he's pretty doing pretty good. <laughs> uh, I, I'm not gonna okay. say. Now we've just determined that people. Possibly look like a platypus. <laughs> <laughs> no, man, he's, he's cool. Right? He's pretty awesome. Plat platypus is just multifaceted, is what we mean by platypus. Like they're, they're, they're good are. at many, many things. They are. They are. But I have um, a question. Not, a, not really a question, but. Um, so, I'm not sure if you're aware, but I do love me some Hello Kitty. And so. I have a lot of Hello Kitty things, and so people always say to me, well, why don't you make glass stuff with Hello Kitty on it? And I'm like, I can't make glass stuff with Hello Kitty on it unless I want to get, you know, pay for licensing to San Rio. But this, and, and you can tell me honestly whether, is it okay to make something with because I have the, a way where I can put an actual image, fuse an image to the glass. And I always tell people when they order it, I'm like, whatever, you have to have permission to use this image or logo or whatever. Right. And, you know, they're paying me for it. What is the, like, the legality of, if I wanted to make something just because I can and just give it as a gift or use it for myself personally, to use that, like a Hello Kitty image. I don't. I don't know that the legality issue really changes. I think uh, as far as whether there's an infringement occurring, I think in a situation like that, the the amount of recoverable damages would would be significantly less than if you're you're selling multiple so. ones. And, and but a lot of people. Uh, a lot of people don't understand this, but they think I'm not selling it, so it's not an infringement. And that's no, just, and, and, still, and, right, and, and you know that, and you know that. Right. But I'm just making that point for people who yeah. are watching. That's just wrong. Don't don't listen <laughs> to that advice. I mean, right. it doesn't matter if you're uh, selling something or not. If you're infringing, in, in for example, a copyright of somebody else's, it even if you're just using it yourself, even if you're not making any money off of it, right. it's an infringement. Now the next question is. Is the copyright owner going to notice that you're doing it? Number one, are you going to even show them the radar? Number two, if you do, are they going to care? Right. Um, 
And, you know, if it's just one use and you're doing it personally, and they're probably not going to know. Number two, even if they find out, is it worth getting their attorneys ready to go? It was only one time to get to make well, it have one, you know. Well, and why I also, I mean, the whole time. so I get that. I mean, like, if I was making something, it's know. never going to see the light of day kind of a thing. But, and I haven't made anything, just for the record, for those listening at home. But with my involvement with people who make and sell things on Etsy, and I have gotten in trouble. Um, by naming something. I made a sun capture that had a margarita glass on it and not thinking I used the word margarita bill, you know, in the title of it. And so I got a letter, well, Etsy got a letter um, to, directed to me telling me, you know, do not use that. And I'm like, seriously, if you're just, you know, you don't have to make a big deal out of it. And it was just an error on my part. I knew that that's the name of a restaurant. But didn't think that it mattered. But anyway, so now I'm like super careful, and I tell people that story to keep them from doing that. But some people have gotten upset because people will make things like embroidered things with like Disney characters, or someone had made something with Hello Kitty um, fabric and used, you know, said Hello Kitty, and they were selling it. And I'm like, I don't think. They understand that they can't do that, and then they get upset because if they get called out on it, but then there are hundreds of other people on there um, making things using the terminology, the likeness. You know, if there are like you can go to Hobby Lobby or one of those places and buy fabric that has Hello Kitty on it, obviously. Just use Hobby Lobby for an example. I don't know if they have it, but they have the permission to sell right. that fabric. Right. But that doesn't mean that someone has the permission to go buy that fabric, make something, and sell it. Well, if, if well, if well, if the fabric itself has already got the imprint on it, mm -hmm. and, and that fabric was licensed by the the trademark and or copyright holder, mm -hmm. then then you've already paid the price for the license by buying the product. So they shouldn't be able to, I guess it, it just depends on how you're going about doing it. Like if you are buying fabric, it's already on there. But I think someone was making, and I, I think she was making like tutus or something and then putting an embellishment on it that was a Well, I mean, if you, if you follow that logic then, couldn't Lisa just go to a shop that sells uh, legal, reproductive, reproduced images of Hello Kitty, buy them, and then take them back to the shop and make glass pieces out of them and sell them? No, I don't think so. Well, that's that's making a different product, really. I mean, when you have a when you're buying a like textile product, it it can be fashioned into multiple different things, right? right. But but it's still the same fabric, you know, as opposed yeah. to an image that you go and you put on a on a separate good altogether. Um, I think it's I, I think it's I think it's more of a, the there are people who aren't they I, I just I don't think that they're doing it to be malicious. I don't think they get it. I don't think they understand how that they can't like make a princess outfit and say that it's you know, Ariel from the Little Mermaid or something. That that's a um, character that is a Disney character or whatever. Yeah, that's a little, that's a little more interesting as far as the because when you deal with clothing, clothing's an interesting area. Oh um, well, I don't want to go down that yeah, crazy that's rabbit cool. hole, but I mean, it's just one of those things that Alice come Wonder up Island, so. at one of our meetings. You know, people will be like. Well, I had to take down this item because it had something. Something I'm like, well, you realize that's a, you know, an image that's licensed to a company, and it's possible that they might just get themselves in a kerfuffle over it. But is yeah, that a word? is that a word? Kerfuffle. <laughs> 
<laughs> we're asking the word. We're asking our word nerd. Yeah. <laughs> Resident word nerd. Um, is that trademark? <laughs> so let's say we wanted to build a restaurant called McDougal's. McDowell's. McDowell's. That's what it was. I was trying to think <laughs> of it. And I wanted golden arcs. So yeah. Golden arches. I mean, you want the big Mac. <laughs> <laughs> How close can you get to hijacking someone? I mean, as long as, as, long as Samuel L. Jackson doesn't come in with a shotgun and uh, threaten then that, that's too close. I mean, McDonald's, that's, you know, McDonald's is, a, uh, is a famous mark, I would, you know, I would argue. And, uh, and that, that's just way too close. But it, we're, Which you know, kind of is crappy. What if your name is? McDonald, and you want to open a restaurant like other people might open up, you know, Robinson's Bar and Grill or something. Now you can't open McDonald's. Well, when, it, when it comes to surnames, there are some interesting. There, some? there are some. There are some exceptions, but because McDonald's is famous, and yeah. there are sometimes there are exceptions that trump exceptions, and so it, it's a um, that's an interesting situation. <laughs> On my website, which is a work in progress, there's a picture of me from, I think, fifth grade. It was a school picture. I don't know the company that took the picture. You know, I, I wanted to use one of my nerd little pictures, but in our basic one, we lost almost everything. That's one of the very few pictures that I have to even be able to use. So I couldn't get something that my mom had taken. Yeah. You know, if it was my touch, is there a certain number of years that go by where it's okay now to use it because I'm a few years and I'm fifth grade? Yes, you are. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> just, I'm just um, me too. Actually, the uh, well, there's two things here. The statute you mentioned statute of limitations, and that really has to do with when you put the you put the image on your website or begin using it. That's what starts that clock. Okay. okay. But another question is, what is the, the duration of the copyright in the photograph? And it, it, it's definitely uh, a long time. I mean, now it's, it's 70 years uh, plus the life of the author, or I believe um, it's always changing. But I think it's 90 years if it's, uh, if it's a published work that a, uh, that a company owns. So it, it's definitely a long time. So we're, we're definitely not at the point where uh, that's going to end. So there's still copyright on that photograph. Owned by somebody. Um, the statute of limitations for that type of claim, I believe, is, is three years. So um, that's uh, what you're looking at on that. So I have an appointment coming up with a photographer to take a, take a new picture, one that I know that I have the rights to. You know, me of you when you were in fifth grade? <laughs> <laughs> but when I told the people that you know the, the website is a work in progress and the picture will be replaced and right. people don't want me to take the picture down. They like the picture and they think that epitomizes word nerd. I don't know if you want to use it. Well, I don't know. Speaking, I mean, I was a photographer. So clearly she's not having me take her photo. But, um, <laughs> but I would think that even if you don't know where that, like who actually took the photo, if, in, I, I mean, if you're not saying that you took it, you know what I mean? Like you could say, you know, a photo of me, you know, class photo of me from fifth grade. I mean, whoever did take the photo, if they found you using it, I don't think they should get angry because you're trying to even credit who took it, but you just don't know. It's yeah. not like you're taking a random photo of someone that's not you and saying it's you or something weird. Yeah, but that's that's not something that I would. I mean, when you when you apply the likelihood here of what would happen, number one, is it likely that you're going to show up on the radar? You know, I don't know. Probably not. Um, and if you do, is any action going to be taken? I don't know that either. Um, 
uh, there's a very good chance that the owner of that copyright doesn't even know they own the copyright because maybe a company's bought another company that was a company. Right. That, you know what I mean? Like, and so, and, and they're not paying people to sit around and look for pictures. I don't think they were taken of individual school children, you know, many years ago. So I would say the risk is probably very low in that situation. Um, but there's no there's no question though about from a legal perspective that. You know, it could arguably be said to be an infringement, and if it is, if there, there's some remedies there. And it, but it, you know, was that picture, was the copyright in that picture registered? If it wasn't, then the owner's not going to be able to get statutory damages, um, so they'd have to prove actual damages. And so, how bad has that owner been damaged by your use of that photo? I think I'm damaged by the photo. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I've been damaged by seeing the photo. I'm just I'm kidding. Uh, um, but no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say it unless uh, you know I was kidding. Um, and, you know, that's uh, that's one of those things where just, I think it's if you're the owner. You're like, really, I'm not going to. You know, one thing about human beings though is you can't predict how they're going to behave. You can't predict what they're going to be reasonable based on what you consider reasonable or not. So that's what I try to tell clients a lot of times because I just can't predict how people are going to react or act. So. But when I had the original draft comment for my business cards, I'm going to get travel letters. I have had them at lots of printers and I don't know if you can do that. And really, there are, there are several fonts. Online, I think that one's probably Yeah, the problem with that is you take the first million dollars, which I don't predict happening anytime soon, but I thought rather than risk it, I would switch to something. But maybe uh, until you put a dent in somebody's pocket. Well, that's true. A lot of times, people, you, you're not going to come up, and I keep using this phrase on the radar, until you are pretty successful, if it, assuming you're doing anything wrong at all. Um, and then people might take a note and say, hey, this company is really successful. Let's see if they're using any of our stuff um, because they would have money to actually pay uh, a license fee or whatever else. But yeah, certain fonts are protected. Um, so. But it is interesting. What she mentioned, what you mentioned about having the right to use an image. Um, because that's something that I'm trying to explain to clients that they don't necessarily, you know, they, they have to, in some cases, pay for licensing of an image and they don't get that. Yeah. Um, yeah. What they're going to use the image for, you know, that it's not just getting, having an image taken, um, but if it's going to go on their website or if you're going to make a, you know, put it on a billboard or, um, if you're an author and you know, your image is going to be on a book, or if it's a photo that's going to be on a book, or whatever, yeah, it's a hard thing to explain to people that they don't necessarily have the rights to the image until they purchase the rights. Right, it's a license. And so, for example, on my website, you see these images that are used. Here's an image on the top. Each one of these categories has these different images. I mean, this this is an image, a photograph, a professional photograph of me that was taken. Um, and those rights were assigned to our company. These the rights on these we, we actually purchased a, a license, a blanket license for this large selection of photographs to use. And so these are paid for um, before we use them. If you go to like the patent section, you see another photograph of this guy here. We had to pay a license fee. Right. Um, and some people just don't. They don't understand how that yeah. works, and we actually um, the there's a photography group that meets a couple times a month, and uh, Matt Gooch is with you. Yeah, Matt. Matt is with. He came in. His mom comes to the group. Patty and, and Matt came and spoke with us over a year ago about you know that whole thing about how that works, and I was just. I'm just still amazed at how people don't 
understand that. You know, I guess I should find some sort of you might even have something on your your site that I can direct people to, like here's the deal with the <laughs> Yeah, I mean I don't I don't have it on my site, but I think, no, I think but I mean, the answer to the, the issue that you raise is that there's a lot of bad advice mm -hmm. out there. Oh yeah, people think like and, oh, well, they're listening to the I mean, but because there's so many people giving bad advice, it, it kind of neutralizes people giving good advice, and so it just right. washes out. And a lot of people just don't really know, and they think, yeah. "Well, it's on the internet, so, and I can copy it, so I can put it on." And it's not the I mean, the general consumer people not usually an issue with them, but it's explaining to a commercial client, especially if they're it's the first time that they're having to have photographs taken for whatever reason, and you know, it's like, you can't just take and go willy-nilly with those, you know, and it's negotiated in a price, too, but it's still hard to explain. Well, you, there, there are some big, I'm, I'm actually probably going to be writing a letter today to one of these, but um, there are some very well-known and highly sophisticated uh, companies that are famous that protect their own brands ferociously, and yet they will use a third party's brand, they'll misuse it, and they'll just uh, they don't even think about it. And it, it's it amazes me because it, it's not just the common man or woman that's you know that at home that makes these mistakes. Some some very uh, very sophisticated clients or not clients but, but companies. Um, uh, make these mistakes, and uh, I would argue there's more culpability there because they should know that. Particularly if they're, if they're particularly if they're going around bopping people on the head for the same kind of thing. Right. Um, so it's 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 all it's across the board. It happens at all levels. So. It's it's interesting how it. I need to I should find some sort of you know like a. Article that someone has written on it, and just keep it for reference when people question me about it. When they don't so you're going to go get an article, and you're going to keep a copy of it. <laughs> yeah. Can I not share the link? I'm not making any money on it. I'm telling you, this stuff is everywhere. It's, it's, I know. I'm like, are you, I you are not listening to me at all? Well, you know, I have failed. <laughs> you know, it's so funny because it's. It's funny how, like, you know, those of us maybe that are sitting in this room, like, we are aware of these things, and like, try you try and do the right thing, and and you could probably like, there's probably a greater likelihood that the person who's trying to do the right thing is the one that's going to get caught than the person who's just like out there, like, randomly yeah. just going crazy, taking images from, you know, doing a Google search and going, oh, hey, look, there's a pretty picture of the sunset. I'm going to put that on my website, you know. Now, what yeah. if you do something like you have an organization, like an entrepreneurial organization, hypothetically, and there's a book that's really cool that was written a long time ago, and it has, like, this line in it that lots of people recognize. Let's say it's, who is John Gall? And you wanted to use that in your promotional materials. What's involved there? That's that's a very good question because it, it's a phrase. It's a short. It's a short sentence. It's a question. Um, and I guess the first question would be: Has that sentence or phrase been used as a trademark or not? Um, it. And that's 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 good. I don't know that uh, I would want to research that because, it, to me, I know what that is. I know what that, that refers to. And I think a lot of the people in the public that are familiar with, the, with that book would would know. Oh, that's referring to. So um, then, is the question for from the consumer's point of view is, is this organization sponsored by or somehow affiliated with? The author, this, this author or the publishing company that owns the rights to the book, um, and but they, they might not have a strong claim there because if, if that phrase has not been used as a as a trademark or a source identifier, then um, 
That's a good question. I, I think there's there's some risk there, but it's not as clear cut as if you just um, used uh, something that you know for sure is, is someone's trademark. But yeah, that makes sense. I, I, I see why you would want to use that. And one could argue that it's it's a, it's a political statement as well. Um, but I think that book is highly political in nature, and uh, as it should be. And uh, maybe you could say, well, that's kind of what we're doing here is making a political statement. And, and based well, on I got to be careful about that. Yeah, because yeah. of the nonprofit status, we can't take, we can't make political affiliations. Yeah, well, the NSA does your, what you're doing anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but really, I mean, because we did have a member. It's actually just been one member so far that was a little upset about us being associated with that book because they felt like it was a. Uh, they, they said, well, you're taking more of a conservative stance instead of a liberal stance. And why are you turning your back on liberals? And I was like, that's not how I read that book at all. And I read that book as capitalism versus socialism <laughs> more than anything. Well, that, the underlying point is, what motivates people to better their society? And as human beings, you know, um, I think this this is a good segue into the foundation for what we have in our country uh, and patent copyright content. The founding fathers in the U.S. Constitution uh, laid the groundwork for our patent copyright system, and they they allowed for limited times. For people to effectively have uh, limited monopolies on their their writings and discoveries, uh, copyrights, you know, and patents, and they did that on purpose because they wanted to motivate people to innovate. Without that carrot, people are not as likely to do so. It's it's literally in our constitution, and, and that's why you find the patent and copyright law are both federal law because it's based directly from the constitution. Um, they saw that then. It's still the case now, and um, it's interesting uh, segue. I've always thought about that, like, because I always feel like the current laws stifle innovation. They like stop people from creating cool things because they're going, man, I'm gonna probably get sued, or I don't have the money to protect myself. I don't have, you know, I can't. Uh, it's like it's preventing cool new technologies from coming out. Because they're just concerned about the fallout. Well, there there are ways to abuse any system, but um, if you can't protect, like if if you're the little guy and you can't go and get a patent, then what's going to keep the big guy from just taking what you come up with and just squashing you? Period. I mean, at least with the patent system, they have something that they could assert. They have a chance. Without it, it's just like, you know, it's like a gnat. It's flipping. Hey, thanks. See you. And the, the big industry takes over and it takes off. Um, the way it's supposed to work is the big company is supposed to see this guy and they're going to say, oh, you have something of, of potential value to us. We'll pay you for it, to buy it from you or to license it from you. And so that little guy that came up with the idea is now motivated monetarily to, to continue to innovate or to, to have done it in the first place. Whereas without that system, why should I do that? A you know, big corporation is going to come along and just take it anyway. So I might as well sit here on this bench. So that's the idea. Now, absolutely, it can be abused. You know, there are companies that, in some cases, buy patent rights and they don't use the technology on purpose. Um, and and they try to keep others from using it. Um, and that. Under the system, some people don't like that. It's like Apple making claims about the, the iPhone of, well, nobody else can have rounded corners. Nobody else can have this kind of touch. Nobody else can have icons that look this way. Nobody, else, you know, all of these things that some of them were like, well, that's just the functionality of a touch device. I mean, you can't, like, say, no one else in the world can build a touch device. Right, yeah. And, and, you know, any company that has the resources that that company has, they're going to try to push to the limits to see what they can keep uh, and, and keep others, their competitors, 
I don't know, maybe like a Samsung <laughs> from, from doing it. So um, they're going to push the limits. And that's where the U.S. Patent Office, uh, in, in the case of patents, has to be, be able to push back and, and to say, no, that's not patentable. Um, I am a little upset with Samsung, though, because they come out with, like, you know, three new models every 30 seconds or something, you know, a phone. And I'm like, instead of doing that, why don't you just build a couple of really, really cool ones, you know, that, that are aluminum bodied and, you know, some gold. Yeah. But they're gold. Right, yeah. I'm not going to be buying a gold phone anytime soon. So. Or maybe it out of titanium instead of, uh, so, you know, you bounce it off the ground and catch it. It's yeah. That'd be cool. Any other questions for Mr. Robbie Robinson before we shut down a little over time? All right, Robbie, thank you for being here today. <laughs> Can you thank our sponsor, RobinsonIPLaw.com, before we sign off? Sure. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the other sponsors, like my firm, RobinsonIPLaw.com. You can also find me on, on Twitter, at PatentMan, uh, and also uh, my associate, Matt Gooch, who works with us. also like to thank Fair Mechanics and uh, Neighborhood Nerds and Pershing Yokely and Associates. Uh, for letting us have this uh, opportunity to, to do this here in this building, which is a very nice building. Um, I think, does that cover? And Lou Keneally Group. And Lou Keneally Group. Uh, IP Law as well. So, um, you didn't do it earlier. I didn't know. I know. I, I, I was like giving you the show. Uh, but cl closing, you can know. Since you asked that right. there was another sponsor. Yeah, we got to get rid of the credit sticks. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks a lot. I do. I feel smarter. And more confused than before. <laughs> more what? That was the goal. I want you to feel empowered, but totally oh, right. I apologize for our questions. Tweeted that. Well, see, now I questioned That town in Colorado I was trying to think of is Durango. Okay. Uh, that's in the it's southwest corner. It's a big tourist town, and that's where. The Purgatory Ski Resort, where they used to train the Olympians, is. Okay. You yeah, mean I'll pull it up a very beautiful place. Um, it, this this. Was